Okay, so now we're heading to our last session, sadly, but I think that we'll end it on a really interesting note. Um, today we have here with us Joanna Ergo, who is working on civic activism in very localized contexts. And we also have uh, the honor of having Irina Solove with us, uh, coming straight from Kiev, and she's a social innovator uh, who will be sharing with us some of the practices and the realities of doing this type of work um, in an extremely challenging uh, context, to say the least. Um, so we started this conference talking about big ideas on democracy, and now we're going to discuss how is it that we can implement them in real uh, scenarios with people and communities and concrete challenges. Um, so, since we have the honor of having Irina, Irina straight from Kiev with us, uh, I want to start this panel uh, by asking you to share, um, we're, we'll get into the work uh, of the two of you in a moment, but maybe you can start us off by sharing a bit about uh, how are things in, in Kiev right now. Um, and what is your, your perspective on this situation as a social innovator? Thank you, and uh, glad to be here. And uh, thank you for making space uh, to talk about the reality of cities that we really love. And uh, we're looking forward to work, uh, with, to continue our work with communities. It's not easy because um, you wake up to uh, um, sirens, alarms that uh, your city is bombed and it's happening in Kyiv, it's happening in Lviv, it's happening um, and when it's in Kyiv it's really on media and uh, be sure that uh, we are bombed second day in a row for, for media coverage to focus on that and not focus on Russians failing uh, in the, on the fire line. But uh, there are other cities like Zaporizhia, Mykolaiv, uh, that uh, Dnipro, that are bombed nearly every day and people are dying there. It makes us Ukrainians fatalistic um, and like, okay, you don't know if you will, will wake up next morning. Uh, at the same time, we also know about us Ukrainians as a nation of um, resilience. We are alive and we are an independent uh, state uh, with its history, culture and uh, really promising perspective because our parents did a good job and their parents did a good job of surviving and not losing a dream of having our own independent sovereign state. And during the last eight years, uh, civil society of Ukraine really managed to do a good job. And now people who were busy doing the, that stuff um, feel like they have uh, to defend not only our dream, but also our reality. And uh, it's very important for us as those who didn't go to front line, didn't to pick up the arms to defend our borders and our independence and, and the lives of our people, because it's really colonial genocide, oh, I don't know how to say it in English correctly, genocide, the genocide uh, war. Um, we are in, in, in a way for Russia, not only in some territorial issues, but rather as an example of society, of post-Soviet society, who if self-organizes and get their stuff together, learns to discuss issues, uh, learns to go into conflicts, learns to do the complicated job of uh, getting citizens, business, and local governments together, um, it can actually uh, be revitalized uh, and energized with the dream for life in democratic inclusive society and uh, we just didn't know but that by being successful for ourselves 
uh, we were really Ukraine centered in our thinking and our activism. Um, and we, we're going to be a threat to a former empire. Um, but now, by becoming a part of this event, I feel like um, it helps me to overcome this uh, Ukraine-centered view and approach. And uh, we feel like we really, our fight is not only for Ukraine, but for the free world. And it's really great that there are events like this who give that feeling this joint uh, work. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Um, at Radical Exchange Foundation, we're deeply inspired uh, by the work of hacktivists who are building social fabric and using information technologies with social technologies um, to reinvigorate a sense of belonging to communities, which is something that has been eroding uh, in the past 15, 20 years, uh, and you can look uh, even further back. And one of our uh, greatest inspirations is the work that is done in Taiwan, uh, also by hacktivist communities, uh, like the ones that you cultivate. And now looking at Eastern Europe, we're also seeing, we've seen uh, some very interesting examples, I think coming from Estonia with digital voting and digital services and how those can serve to um, create opportunities for civic participation. There are a lot of interesting sort of hackathon initiatives and uh, bottom-up organizing. Um, and what, what we, part of our motivation uh, in coming here to Varsov is also to shed light on the digital democracy initiatives that are coming uh, from Eastern Europe in general. I think that you're providing an example to the world of um, how to really embed these ideas that are so talked about maybe in the blockchain space or in the civic technology or golf tech space. Uh, how, how is it that we can really um, integrate them in our local contexts? So we're uh, deeply honored to, to have you here and especially in a challenging time like this, uh, challenging to say the very least, um, a tragical time. Um, so to, to get us started with our conversation um, about civic hacktivism and, and social technologies, um, could you share first, you, Irina, with us a little bit about your work um, and what you're doing at uh, Garage Gang? Thank you. Um, this has been like 13 years already. We started really informally in 2008. The inspiration for us was the, if you remember, global financial crisis. We thought this is really shitty situation. We have enough ideas, enough talented people, and uh, enough of professional background to organize things differently. So we were acting kind of in crisis, but the, from the feeling of profit. Um, and um, it was uh, at the moment when uh, was the world uh, and Europe specifically was really um, found with the idea of creative cities. So we pick up this model of um, Charles, uh, I don't remember his name, it's really the, the long road today. Uh, yes, 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 true. Uh, he, 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 he suggested that there is a certain sequence that you should go if you want to transform your city into a creative hub. And first you work on the connections, then you work on ideas, and then you work on uh, actions, spaces, and markets. And uh, so year by year we were taking one factor and would uh, go to Ukrainian cities to activate it. So at first we were ex explaining to people what is creative cities. So you can imagine in 2010 we went to five cities, we uh, bought a, a traveling van, we changed it into mobile office and we brought it to the central square of the cities. We stayed there for five days and uh, people would pass through us and we show movies, dance together. Uh, read poetry, uh, have exhibitions like in Ujhorod, uh, we had like 70 events, uh, of course, organized with uh, local activists um, and uh, especially those uh, focused on arts and culture. So year by year, we would activate the factor. For example, we have now a crowdfunding platform called Big Idea, that which we created because uh, we realized that people have a lot of ideas, they're open to new things, but they 
cannot apply for big grants or complicated uh, political uh, advocacy uh, stuff. Uh, before you start doing reforms, you actually have to uh, give people positive experience when they can implement their own ideas, when they uh, emerge as, as leaders with po positively confirmed um, changes that th they can do it. And then, then of course, you, you will get more and more support for the reforms that are more complicated uh, and uh, take time to an effort to, to, uh, to implement. So we were successful to implement that model. I will start from uh, to, to, to show you the radical change that happened in 10 years. It's like in 2010, we explained people what Creative City is. In 2018, creative industries go into the uh, law, so it's, it's recognized by state and uh, receives funding from the state. And uh, it, the mantra of uh, IT industry, which didn't have any charm before, and now we are the creative industries making the most <laughs> contribution to the economy. So if you um, act small but keep radical perspective of big idea in front of you, you will, it, it, we, we thought it's going to take us the entire our life to change something in Ukraine. The, the atmosphere was like this. You, you, no matter how much effort you put, nothing will change. And we're like, okay, it's going to be our samurai road. And then in 10 years, it's implemented. We're like, okay, what do we do now? <laughs> So now we, we have a new perspective, a new strategy, and uh, if I have time, we can discuss that too. Yeah, that would be lovely. Um, but first, let's go into uh, Joanna's work. Can you tell us about the work you're doing here in Warsaw? Yeah, uh, hi. Currently, I'm working on a cooperative, which aims to uh, restart cooperative movement in Poland, and uh, part of which is uh, launching uh, platform cooperatives. But what we are trying to do, we are trying to be a kind of mediator between the old uh, cooperative movements, so people who are uh, probably like average 50, 70, 60, uh, most of them are of course uh, men, because this is the core of the cooperative uh, movement, but they are very embedded in the local uh, local uh, communities and they uh, are somehow under capitalist in the way of the capitalism that we know, so we treat them as a good partner, but because what we are trying to do, we are trying to, uh, to use uh, technology as a to, uh, to change our uh, reality, which is the material reality. And, like, I'm, uh, my background is that I'm the urban activism. I'm one of the people who started like Warsaw Urban Movement. So uh, uh, if you see like bike lanes, green spaces, uh, it's uh, due to us, it's our success. Uh, and so uh, and somehow I'm the, in the similar situation that you do, that somehow you can, your postulates are in the mainstream and what you do next. Uh, and what we uh, do next, we know that uh, now if you think about a smart city uh, of the new generation, you have to build like the local resilience, so you have to uh, go into economical perspective. It's on not only participation and getting people uh, involved in the participatory practices, because they are quite developed in Poland. We have as well the iteration of the um, Barcelonian platform, the CDIM. Uh, it's uh, Gdynia made its Polish version. It's called uh, Gdynska Platforma Dialogu. So uh, Gdynia uh, platform for dialogue. It's like open source, so every city can use it. But what we are trying to show that now you have to go into public uh, space, look around and see what does it mean to be a, a smart city. And the first generation, which you probably know of the smart city, was the idea that you have the big tech who is uh, coming into big cities, giving you uh, the infrastructure, the hardware, and they are getting the data. We don't care because everything is in the cloud, uh, it's invisible, and if, because we are fighting for the public space, which, which is a material space. And what we are trying to show and what I'm trying to show when I, we, I talk with the local government, that the digital space is part of the hybrid space we, we live on the everyday basis. So you cannot talk about good public space when you are forgetting about the digital space because we are hybrid, uh, hybrid people. And uh, what is uh, a huge mi mistake that I think we are still making, that we are dividing discussion about public space from the discussions from the digital space, because we are a closed uh, environment. 
I'm the person who is coming from the like more material uh, perspective, so I'm really happy to be here with you because I think we are taking part in a very huge revolution that we have to translate all the very complex tools that you created into something which is more accessible to the everyday people who want to have something which is not made by hackers for hackers, that it's so difficult, but it's much easier and it's intellectually much easier. And one of the examples how we are trying to show how you can think about smart city of the future or the democratic hybrid space of the future. It's asking people whether they know how much city earns on the parking lots of this uh, smart city infrastructure, which is uh, led usually by uh, foreign companies. And if you take city, for example, of Shanov, which is our partner of, uh, of 50,000 people, people, they used to uh, get 30% of, uh, of the money uh, in the system paid by the people who are parking. At the moment, they are get getting only 2% because the uh, big players divided the market and they are giving the dump dumping um, payment. So we are saying like, come on, it's not fair. We don't have the influence on the public, uh, on the mobility um, politics. We pay for it. Uh, so the only thing that is uh, our gain is that it's a kind of organized and you've got the lanes which are pa painted and repainted by the uh, huge tech. But maybe it would be better if we would develop uh, together with the city council uh, development cooperative and all invest our uh, time and knowledge and decide how much we would like to pay and uh, on which terms uh, we would like to use, uh, for example, this pi uh, parking spaces. So how, uh, do you, how do you achieve that? How are you able to increase that, say, over the infrastructure, the digital infrastructure that is around? We are not talking only about the digital infrastructure because um, uh, um, we are starting with the physical infrastructures. We are saying, for example, that if you have like empty lots, you can um, uh, use it together with people and then uh, um, have an addition which is like uh, 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 digital. Uh, at the moment, we are talking as well with the city of uh, uh, Wrocław, which is interested in creating their own local uh, shop with the local product uh, to strengthen uh, local businesses. Uh, because in Poland, we have the problem that our local market are the market like Lidl or Biedronka, which is Jeronimo Martins. And um, um, what is really the interested moment, that small uh, city, uh, city council of the smaller cities decided to realize that the deal between them uh, and the big companies is not fair. Big cities still think that they are part of the smart city project, like New York, London, and so on. And uh, small cities know that they have to change their strategy because they don't get taxes uh, and they don't have uh, any uh, influence. So at the moment we are uh, making uh, the narration work and uh, hopefully soon we'll be developing first development uh, uh, s uh, s strategies in different side of uh, size cities like uh, from Dombrowa Gornicza, which is 250 city and the uh, core of the uh, this development cooperative will be a place similar to the one that we are here but a future surrounded by the new housing but for example in Seine which is on the border of uh, Lithuania will have the local market with this, its digital version. So you can like shop uh, in person, but you can shop uh, uh, online or you can order some stuff and um, pick it in person and buy something more and then stay in the, uh, in, in the countryside. Uh, probably for you it sounds very basic, but uh, when we want to work with like, local people and local governments, we, we have to focus on things that um, uh, probably for many of you, they are uh, simply boring because they are simple. And, uh, and for me, like innovation, it's in the place when you uh, contact uh, abstract ideas and digital solution with the really harsh materiality. And, yes, I couldn't agree more. Um, so speaking about harsh materialities, uh, Irina, how has your work changed uh, after first all of the achievements uh, that you've uh, made, but also um, after the war began? It's uh, what, what's different uh, during the past half a year. Uh, Ukrainians uh, get active 
highly active. So we have uh, growth of uh, civic organization being registered 12 times the, qual the quantity of the last year. So it's people wow. who bothered to go and register their organization. You can imagine how many more people don't bother to, to register. So we don't know. It's really like extreme growth. Yeah. But what? Yeah, and then and this sounds like a dream of anybody who would have all this panel, like how do we grow the civil society in Ukraine? You start the war, the big war. Uh, unfortunately, this is the, the reality. The revolution and wars uh, do push uh, civil society uh, to grow. That's uh, why, I, why I, me, I personally am a fan of that type of work when you go slowly day by day by small things you change so there is no blood there is no um, tears uh, and uh, what it means for for us for example for our platform you build certain knowledge that is available to society how to use your instruments uh, what it means to like activate the community uh, what you need to 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 grow to to develop and then, and then uh, a lot of people coming in and and they start to kind of uh, reestablish things because they they don't have time to to learn how things were done before so they they need mon bigger money. They need fa uh, this money faster. They they cannot report it. Um, you dream like okay, you report at this level, and next year we're gonna do better. So you report even better. But then new people arrive like. <laughs> no. The work and, starts from yes. Here. Yeah. Uh, but still, uh, for example, I, I, I uh, was an expert on one of our local kind of conversation about civil society and, uh, and, 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 and me as an expert, I was really humbled by what people are doing in cities like Zaporizhzhia, Dnipro, Ivana Frankis, like really amazing stuff. Can you describe this initiative? <sighs> Uh, they would, for example, quickly in a few months rebuild like old housing to make it uh, livable for people and really nice because urbanists, they, they know how to do stuff quickly and if they get enough volunteers, it's really how fast things can be uh, done and done nicely and smartly. Uh, other people, for example, they would uh, relocate from Mariupol and then go to Zaporizhia but stay active uh, organize like food, humanitarian aid, uh, of course, uh, medicine stuff and some other stuff that they don't talk about, but it's really the amount and the intensity is, is huge. Uh, and, 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 and me, I'm like thinking uh, as, as a social innovator, you really need to think ahead what, because you can start small. So you need to, to, to understand what small thing you can do now. So it pushes the big picture. And I'm like, okay, these people doing this big stuff. And then like, okay, they, they asked me, so, so share what, what you know as an expert. And I did share, and uh, I would mention a lot what work we started to do. And after the 2020, we uh, paid attention to team uh, environment. It's also very hybrid now. Uh, and we realized, and also I, I really celebrate you going for the economical uh, kind of I don't know, sphere uh, in society, because that's what we think it makes sense now. It, you, I would, 10 years ago, I wouldn't think that uh, being a social innovator, uh, social activist, you, you will go uh, to generate inst uh, instruments, build instruments to help business, so business can survive this uh, time of intensive change, complex change, so your society has uh, money to, 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 to fund those changes, because if we really want to on changes and we don't want to depend so much on the our partners in Europe or in states uh, to, 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 to sustain that uh, agency that we kind of got on the cultural level you re the, your next step logically is to, 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 to see what makes business resilient so and realized uh, our Ukrainian business doesn't realize uh, the challenges that the global changes uh, of citizenship uh, are bringing to the labor market 
um, the way we uh, start to see ourselves as citizens that uh, do not uh, limit their role to voters, but they want to actually actively co-create the environment they live in working, uh, changes the labor market entirely because uh, now you will not go to work uh, where the pay is the highest, uh, but work is the meaningless. You will go, you will lo look for the meaning first. You will do care in, about economical side, but you don't care about job security anymore. You, you, you want to have between job security. Then if your work <laughs> is not good for you to allow to do the volunteer or activism work you want to do, you will change it because before you, because you don't think in terms of keeping, preserving the job. You, you, you think in terms of, uh, can I survive that period? I cannot find the job that, uh, that, that, that helps me to do my work. People start to have like lifetime project and they take the job that helps them to, to, to build that influence, that, that impact they, they want to have in the world. And Ukrainian business is not good at, at watching those trends. Even, uh, and we don't have uh, analytical capacity, unfortunately, in society, like, for example, uh, American society has. They have uh, McKinsey that puts that all in numbers and already gives some sort of advice. I think we are better with, <laughs> with approaching that, but still, there is at least analytics there. So, uh, and, and may, the, uh, returning to the story about the uh, civil, civil society meeting and, and con discussing our issues, uh, they didn't react to anything I said on uh, society structure and that. But what they did react when I asked them what was useful for what I told you, they all mentioned stuff that they speak about teams and how people work now. So this subject of uh, resilient teams, uh, we call it not resilient, we call it balanced team because we, we view team as an ecosystem. Uh, they, most of them who give me feedback, they reacted to that part. So we realized it's not only, even though you uh, can be really influ like important player and, uh, of, of current situation, the challenges that the society uh, um, is experiencing are nearly the same. So it's difficult for business to, to work with because labor market is uh, treating everybody equally. <laughs> In a sense, so it's it's uh, interesting moment that um, it, while you 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 have the necessity and capacity to go bigger on a civil impact, uh, you're still dealing with the challenges that are common to the entire society and. Now it's a global challenge. It's how to uh, build teams that uh, are satisfying to uh, people and uh, that are still economically make sense to business because it's a, um, economical system is very much related to political system, to civil system. It's uh, an illusion that we can separate it. So I, I want to get more into this question of uh, team building and collaboration, but I'm curious um, about one thing. So the two of you are working with uh, economic platforms, right? For, uh, with platform cooperatives and uh, with tools for crowdfunding so that you can sort of empower individuals and groups um, to have more ownership over their work and the infrastructure that they're building and, and using in their daily lives. So um, we're here at an event that uh, has lots of people who are in the blockchain world, which is also committed to uh, providing financial infrastructures for individuals and communities, um, but is often disconnected from uh, neighborhoods, communities, cities, uh, real social fabric. So what are, what would you, um, what is the message that you'd like to get across for people who are building in this environment about how is it that this technology or can be me really meaningful or um, or not? Uh, what are the what are uh, blockchain people failing at, in your view? I think I, I don't think it's about failing. I think we have each of us has got its own role to do. And what, for example, I think we are working. We are working uh, on uh, changing a wider uh, view uh, on the economy and showing that uh, uh, blockchain technology or other alternative currencies 
will be the easiest way uh, to solve our problems. For example, tracking food and uh, showing uh, what is the difference uh, between food that is uh, made, uh, grown locally and the one that comes uh, from Asia and sh or showing the transaction, who was involved of, uh, in uh, creating something and showing people that um, uh, very de highly developed te technology can give them two things what people in Poland need, uh, want to have. They want to have influence and uh, they want to have uh, inf uh, information. So they, want to be, they don't want to be cheated. And uh, what is really uh, weird in our country that we have very low level um, of uh, trust towards everything apart from technology. Uh, we really trust te uh, uh, te technology. If you had this um, uh, European researches where Europeans uh, say that they would uh, trust more artificial intelligence, even knowing how nasty it can be, than politicians, uh, we, we are in the top of this, uh, in the top of these votes, which is really good. But uh, what you need is to show the average people that it's uh, blockchain is uh, not nasty, local currencies are not something weird, but it can be simple. And uh, somehow big uh, companies are helping us, the big uh, commercial uh, chains, for example, the Zabka chains, the one in the Small Froggies uh, franchise. They are uh, um, implementing something that what they call jobs. So they are like tokens that you can collect for buying stuff and then that you can exchange them for something else. They have learned people in Poland that uh, if you want discount, you show your app. Uh, now uh, the shops don't give any discount, but they still uh, ask you for showing your app, so you leave your data. And uh, when you, are, you have a society which is trained uh, more and more using the technology, somehow it would be uh, easier for all us saying, okay, uh, this is corporate technology, but uh, we have something which is alternative, is good for you, you will have access to your data, you will have control of what happens uh, um, with your data, how it's used, or you can use, uh, uh, create alternative currencies. For example, when what we were talking before, before the dis discussion. When uh, we are developing our uh, development co cooperative models, uh, the, our main addresses is the uh, local middle class. So we say it would be nice if local people who have uh, mm, some, some savings could uh, keep them not in bank or uh, buying tokenized apartment in Spain or NFT or something ridiculous but they could put it in this development cooperative so we could together b build an urban farm with co-work, with nursery and stuff like this. Uh, part of this will be commercial, the money will be um, uh, used for something, uh, something good. And uh, uh, one introduced w any Web3 systems within the communities that you're working with? Not yet, but Not uh, yet. What, I want to, uh, what I want to finish. But what we want to do is uh, to show that people uh, not only can, can pay by money, but they can pay by their work or their intellectual uh, input. Yes. And to count this input, you need some alternative currency. We use, uh, we use the word token or in Polish bond. Uh, not to make it scary. So uh, we are trying to use the, this idea that uh, doing volunteer work is uh, as well a work that should be counted in. Uh, and we need uh, alternative currency simply to exchange it and to make it fair because now it's not fair because people are doing a lot of voluntary work and uh, which is uh, not uh, uh, valued. If I'm understanding you correctly, um, you're saying that uh, sort of traditional uh, cryptocurrencies are expressing financial values, but if we can have uh, alternative currencies that are also expressing other forms of contributions that you can make to your community, or uh, I think I also... No, I'm not saying that uh, blockchain uh, is uh, into like the uh, conservative meaning of money. I say that uh, we are, uh, need a different story about society uh, to uh, show that all the things that are now um, recognized as really alternative, difficult only for hackers can be part of our everyday experience because we are more open to the innovations that uh, we think that we are. So it gives us so sort of new... Um these new technical architectures sort of offer us the opportunity to imbue our economic systems with a different set of values. Yeah. Somehow, yeah.
<clears throat> Let me continue on that story because we actually went further and thought what could be uh, actually um, done uh, if, we, if we can uh, account for that contribution. Because we are a crowdfunding platform, so for us it's interesting. Uh, uh, we, we have this uh, financial contribution. It's uh, charity or giving. It's not charity because it's not to give to feel better about yourself. It's really a contribution, a stake. The, it's about belonging of becoming a part really participatory uh, act uh, to be part of something that you want to see around and for us it's interesting to see to sort the, that contribution so now we're using this model of uh, creative cap uh, city capitals it's a cultural uh, human uh, capital social capital and infrastructural capital so it's it's very simple somewhere in Singapore they have really a lot of indicators and they do a good job collecting government to collect all the data. Uh, but we think even if we use it as a narrative to see if our cities, our communities uh, are developing in a more or less balanced way. Because if you have uh, only cultural capital, great values, but no trust as a social value or no human, low human capital, you would have a radicalization of society, not maybe in a very good way because it's a lot of energy, but you cannot uh, use it constructively. Yeah. So we think our narrative at this today, as for today, <laughs> because we have a narrative for the next day, and uh, we think that actually um, co-funding system that we are promoting now in Ukraine and we we'll also suggest to our European partners uh, when citizens, business and local governments, uh, th they can co-fund those changes, those projects that contribute to all of those four capitals and then they can b pay it, for example, you don't need to bring it all to one platform like ours, the, the, the data of, from different platforms can be combined from business, uh, can be combined from local government, can be combined. All you need is just to market somehow, like get the add, like metadata to data, and and then you can you can have a picture of what's going on in your community. And uh, we know from our experience, even if we tell a story of community uh, in art form, it strengths community str like really a lot because if you know yourself, you can act in that story. You you become an you start to play an active role. So when, where we see it's going and where we, I think, I personally definitely committed to, to make this story real, we think that uh, where uh, the global story should get radical uh, is that now data, and it's, I'm, I'm so happy to be here. I'm, I'm like, oh, my person's picking my stuff up. Oh, <laughs> uh, government and business now are using data Business even learn how to earn on it. Government uh, not yet <laughs> knows how to, to use it. They just collect it. They ha they can have access to it. But citizens, they are the main uh, data prosumers. They produce a lot of data and they could consume some data if we build an infrastructure uh, for the citizens who want, who are, uh, feel that they don't want to be just voters and technical voters, not going anywhere because my vote will be misused, but actually those who want to co-create. And I'm thinking of such concept as data pocket. Uh, which means that uh, it's, a, it's like a data lake in corporations, but personal one. So you can c just collect and keep data sorted, not sorted, raw. Uh, and we're thinking that uh, one day, there, there is already an ecos I was thinking about this idea like three years, 16, 18, 19. Then I realized only one guy thinks about something similar, Lee, he has Open Data Institute. but. What, what we need to democratize is to uh, provide infrastructure for citizens, regular citizens, who, for example, vote now in particip participatory budget of community or contribute financially at the crowdfunding platforms or contribute with their time as volunteers or contribute their intellectually. They, they, if they are part of some teams of some uh, community projects, it can, it's re easily can be registered. And one, on one hand, we have better picture of understanding what works, what doesn't work. It's a regular analytical work. But also we would like for citizens to be able to get their data assets, 
or I don't know how to, to call it properly. <laughs> um, so they can contrib contribute it as well as money. So for example, there will be a mar data uh, market where you can, uh, there is a request sent and as a citizen, you can contribute your data to help with this uh, analytics and then you get back your data and you get back data so used like the, the the results of that analytical work also okay it's a, it's a concept so it's a bit messy but um in the participatory process yes, or uh, yeah. being interviewed by the researcher when the yeah, researcher yeah, gives you yeah. the uh, and then it's registered uh, because yeah. you still do it mostly online now so but but now as a as a main citizens and i'm pointing myself because I'm, I'm the type of citizen when we produce a lot of data but we cannot use it and we don't have infrastructure for citizens to earn something i think money also with this and uh, i think uh, we can get there in 10 or 20 years um okay i have one more question we don't have a lot of time but i'm super curious um so you're talking about ways in which individuals and communities can have sort of a lot more agency over what they're producing um, and what they're consuming as well in the infrastructure uh, around them um, what do you see as the right role for government institutions today? So you have a very sophisticated vision of how individuals and communities can sort of um, have much more ownership and agency over uh, their own environments. Where, where does the government come in? What's the appropriate role or the nature of the relationship between government institutions and, and uh, in local communities? Uh, asking this question in Poland, when you have the government which would like to control your every step, they are you know, would like to uh, control uh, how much pornography you, you watch. This is what they uh, are, are talking about in the uh, in the parliament at the moment. So at the moment, government is not a partner. That we are talking about like this uh, alternative networks and this like this kind of cooperative groups. Uh, and I'll, other. I asked this question. I'll add a bit more of context, which is that uh, you, Joanna, were. Uh, candidate uh, for the city of Varsov, uh, mm -hmm. for mayor of Varsov, and you talk about um, how you are uh, trying to implement these changes in government in uh, getting government institutions to fund and support cooperatives in developing public infrastructure. You're talking about how um, Creative Cities made its way to legislation, and I think that's very, very unique because it's a contrast. Uh, it's in contrast with a vision of technology as a way to sort of um, liberate yourselves fully from governments and not have to collaborate with them. So I'm curious to know more about sort of you, what's your vision for the appropriate role of government and how is it that government and civil society I think to help uh, create um, infrastructure to transparently use the data and to sort it uh, because we have in Warsaw uh, basis of open data, so of, of open data, and if you are uh, not a professional, you cannot uh, cannot use it. But uh, when when you try to put it uh, really up to the ground for us, it would be very valuable for the local communities whether to know how many of the customers of the local restaurants are the incomers uh, who park illegally, or how, how many of them are the local society, uh, how many of the uh, cars that are marking the traffic are the uh, uh, people who are not paying the taxes because uh, they move out of the city and so they are sort of information uh, ledgers and, and digital infrastructure providers yes probably uh, uh, probably yes because uh, for me like cooperation between different sectors uh, government and non-government and private and all the other like citizens movement uh, there are like four legs that uh, allows you uh, to have the full transparency and uh, uh, the whole uh, uh, stability. As a member of the uh, urban movements, we always try to, uh, whether we are asked uh, whether if you are a member of an urban movement, you, you should uh, um, go for a public uh, role or do something else. We, are, uh, we say that we have to be everywhere because uh, we uh, all are fighting for the whole reality, not only for the part of it. We don't want to have an alternative, uh, um, alternative bubble. Yes, and when we talk about this like role, and we, we, we need to remember that we talk about vacuum, like uh, ideal situation, because uh, digital infrastructure in Ukraine we have, it's not bad, but we still realize it's a political project. So 
keeping that in mind, uh, in ideal situation, I think that uh, government, its role in any time is to scale the norm. Norm is formed by business because business checks it for vitality, uh, that it, it can survive. Culture creates a lot of uh, ideas, innovation, so new values uh, emerge. Then that it's something get normalized through economic activity, and then that norm that checked that it's uh, viable uh, gets scaled. So in that sense. Uh, assuming that we have this reality where data pocket not any more concept but some MVP then I see state as a, this um, data ecosystem and the infrastructure for where the state guarantees something and guarantees for example that this exchange of data we imagine there is such like technology and uh, because technology is still going there it's not there I checked <laughs> at least <laughs> a year ago it was not there uh, ready for this concept and but um, uh, state as uh, data health and data ecosystem would be th that's how I imagine it let's see in 10 years where we are and check our or five yeah <laughs> maybe <laughs> in Ukraine yeah. we, we take it you know like we still have a war to win <laughs> Um, Jack is signaling to me that we should be wrapping up, but um, I want to, since we don't have a session after this, I want to give uh, our audience the opportunity to ask questions. Um, so maybe someone can take a microphone and is, are there any questions out there? It can be just a reaction, not necessarily a question. Questions are hard, I know. <laughs> don't be shy. Mm -hmm. Uh, a bit of a lateral question, maybe, but uh, you you mentioned uh, you mentioned about uh, Ukrainian digital in infrastructure. Uh, I guess you're talking about the the uh, yeah. the uh, can you can you make a quick comment like as an Ukrainian? What's what's your opinion on on this like mm. government pro provided digital infrastructure? Uh, okay. Um, what, what was good, and I think uh, they reacted quickly in terms of uh, 2020 pandemic when you could uh, upload your uh, yeah COVID pass. It was uh, convenient because you you go any restaurant and you show it. And um, what was also good there. So so what I like just continuing because you, you with that question you give me a, a space to to continue. I really believe that we can do things now even with the technology at the level it is now, for example, I see a potential in bringing blockchain to real estate now in Ukraine because a lot of housing will be rebuilt. It would be nice at least for that uh, part section that will be rebuilt to, to already do it in, a, in a, um, uh, applying uh, this technology. So also. and later it will just uh, uh, scale and... and, and how so? Uh, for example, who gave the money? How much time it took to oh. to build it? How uh, who who will be living there? So so it's transparent uh, because yeah. in, in when you go like uh, GDP, it's, it looks like nice, but then it happens somewhere and not where it's needed, and and you know way to to check it, and then. Uh, whenever there is a crisis, it's the place where you need to, to do to start doing things in a way that you are better afterwards than you were before. If it, if it was ruined, then there is no sense to just to rebuild it to the point where it was before. It's really the uh, we need to make an effort, concentrated, focused effort to add the new reality to, to, to something we build now. So that's why when we go even to the smallest community like villages or small cities, we really also see a big potential working with small cities. We come there with the most new thinking we, we come up and it works in the small communities and bigger communities, they have the resources and people and everything to replicate. They just, they just need somewhere how, how it works. People are good at mimicking and all you need to kind of role model, that's it. Any other questions? So as you are talking about those smaller communities, what are your kind of strategies uh, to build trust towards those solutions, to kind of engage people or you know, just to make them adopt them uh, fully? Because I understand those people who have not only financial resources to understand them like in these bigger towns, they also have these cognitive uh, capa capacities to better understand and therefore maybe trust the solutions. But how do you work with, uh, with the smaller communities? 
Okay. I'll be short and then maybe you can add. Uh, when we come to communities and smaller communities even more, we think these people uh, are more cognitively capable than us because we come to the environment we know nothing about. We know everything about the environments we used to work and then while we were working in different cities, it's already changed so we also like if we're fair enough, it's, we don't know anymore what's happening there. So when you come and with the trust to the context and with the idea that people who live there know their communities better than you, you have a chance. And then it, it just uh, after that it goes naturally. When you start asking questions and you listen and you share only the expertise you're good on and the team you're coming and you demonstrate the relationship in your team that uh, every uh, opinion is respected, you apply your rank correctly, uh, frame it that, for example, I have experience in this, can I add my uh, thinking, we should, you should take account, and then, and then you step back and, and allow people to also bring their rank, sometimes it's a social rank in community, it works. It's, it's really, really easy and pleasant. It's when you think that people are somehow incapable and you are such a helper and you come and you bring your agenda and people like, so what, you have an agenda, okay. Mm. It doesn't work. Even now, even now, I will, a short example in Chernigiv, they come from, uh, from, they have a background in government, so they ha know how to do, take resources from Minister of Culture and they want to rebuild the uh, library. No roof. And they go, okay, we have the money, we have the project, we're going to put the roof, winter is coming. And people are like, no. Because they, they don't want to lose this agency. This agency, even it's not manifested, it's there because it's natural. And then well, uh, it's a matter of giving space for that agency to show up and be patient enough, be patient and trustful. Because it, uh, why would I show you my agency? And okay, you're listening, okay. Oh, you're understanding, oh, you even care, okay. There are, there are good methodologies one I would recommend is uh, appreciative inquiry. It works everywhere and it's very safe. It's very ecological, so you will not go wrong with this. Uh, try to Google it, like appreciative inquiry. Three questions and it activates any community. Okay, uh, for me what strengthens trust is uh, practice of doing things together, the thing, the, what is necessary. We as a cooperative, we have really different uh, projects. Some of them are around uh, food farms, uh, some of them are about around energy, some of them are around uh, digital tools. And what we are, what we are trying to do is uh, to uh, strengthen ideas of the local leaders. And sometimes there are people who are uh, people from the administration, sometimes they are uh, leaders of the uh, NGO or uh, different groups. Uh, we often fail because sometimes uh, priorities uh, uh, differ and we uh, as well know that sometimes you need time because you are thinking not only with your mind but as well with your body. So you sometimes need to adapt to a new uh, situation or sometimes you have to change your thinking. So uh, I think like strengthening leaders, giving us uh, time and being really close to people needs is the, the, only, the only solution. Well, the, the short story about the failure, because uh, we have this story with my team where I think we were successful. My team thinks, still thinks they, they failed, like when you say we failed sometimes. It was Slavutic near the Chernobyl, a small city, and we were, had this program, we come, we do a mural, uh, and, and, and uh, we, okay. So, so we come up with this idea of having a mural. And then somebody in, on Facebook said, but we don't like this idea for mural, let's not do it. And, and then our artist who was with us on the team said, okay, tomorrow at two o'clock, if you don't come and do, show, do not show that you really don't want it, we're gonna make it. <laughs> and you imagine the work day, two o'clock <laughs> in the afternoon, a lot of people come and really active. They're gonna not let us do it. We didn't do it uh, finally. And I was so happy because I was in Germany at, on the conference and they showed me the, 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 the drawing, like it, it's horrible. And I cannot tell to my team, like it's horrible, don't do it. <laughs> it's my team, I should respect uh, decisions but uh, so people stopped <laughs> uh, but why I think it's a success because your, your, your purpose is to activate the local community 
and if and the local community activates not to do to let you do a horrible mural it's it's success but they didn't tell my team it was horrible <laughs> mural they just said okay it's sometimes it's like this <laughs> sounds good well this is a lovely story and uh, an amazing conversation thank you so much for being thank you. with us and uh, thank you to all of you Thanks. for uh, staying up until the end with us in this conversation. I think it was super inspirational to hear uh, about the work that the two of you are doing. And um, I hope that we can continue being in touch and collaborating um, as Thanks. Radical Exchange Foundation. Thanks. We're open. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.